Um, paganism, beginning paganism, and what paganism means in our culture. And one of the things I was really attempting to do is to create a base of science, because science is nature. It's what nature is. And as, as pagans, we have a tendency to, to follow myth a little bit too much, so we don't have the power of the substance of science. And so today, we ha are introducing Marcus, who is a particles physicist at Fermilabs, right? And um, I have asked him to come in. I've got a couple of sheets in so he can sort of see what I'm focusing on. But it was a lot of the notes that we took when we were at dinner. Um, and I'm hoping that you can expand on some of those concepts. Um, here we're talking about, in the last lesson, we were talking about Satan, and we were showing how our concepts around deity and Satan and gods frame our, frame our universe. So what we believe is possible um, by, oh, see, determines what you believe. So. In other words, if you have an idea that you can only go so far, that's as far as you're going to go. If you believe that you cannot interact with the universe at deeper levels, then you probably won't, because you won't know what questions to ask, which is part of what I was saying to you, is that if you have a certain context, then you're only going to ask questions according to that context. If you start moving outside that context, you don't have the questions, you don't know to answer them. Um, to help us appreciate pagan philosophy, uh, that consciousness is not an accident. The big question is, what is conscious? Are the, is, is Anubis here conscious? Or are we bringing in life into Anub Anubis into our, um, through our intent? So I am interested in looking at other sources that pagans use in order to help us understand, help us understand the universe. So these sources are mysticism, science, and personal experience. Chris, you were here to rip my That's all right, I can do it all by myself. I want you, through this, this camera, we're going to take a uh, picture of what these questions are because if you come back next time I'd like you to bring these answers. I don't want to spend time on discussion right now. I want to spend as much as I can um, give Marcus as much floor as he needs. So if you want to see this later we'll post it on the website and I'd like to talk about these more <coughs> Uh, next in the next two weeks. All right. See that? <laughs> now this is your job. So let's look at the tr let's look at the universe in terms of light waves, particles, quantum theory versus Newton, please. And and um, how about John Stuart Bell? how the two particles, apparently when they've touched each other, how do they then interact? String theory, who was David Bohm? Who was Wolfgang Pauli? And what was his relationship with Carl Jung? Who was Carl Frederick van, how do you say this? Weizsäcker. Weizsäcker, thank you. And what is the Josephson effect? Electrical magnetic interactions and quantum hall effects, right? Take it away. Please. <laughs> okay, I think I'll give a spoiler already in the beginning because I, I might skip a few of those items That's just funny. because I, I'm not personally have an expert on, on, on certain of these aspects. Um, when, when Amanda and I met for the first time, she immediately approached me with this question, uh, spiritual person against the analytical scientist. 
And, and we had a very interesting discussion going on, which took then uh, also one dinner. Um, and, and I think this is, this is very important when, um, when all these questions come up and we look at the universe in, in, in terms of these scientific, let's say, terms, that we have a, that we have a very limited view on, on nature. So what, what science is that um, we observe nature in a, in a measurement. It's important that this measurement, we can reproduce those measurements. And then we try to interpret that in terms of a theory. And each good theory makes certain predictions. And you wanted to talk me about, for instance, Newton. One of the simple things would be in Newtonian mechanics, you have a ball, you throw that ball. So you just um, make a measurement. At one second, this ball is here. At two seconds, this ball is here. At the end, this ball um, traveled that distance, so and so many feet, uh, perhaps uh, more than one yard. And, and then you try to get some, from the curvature, you try to determine somehow the scientific principle behind that. And the important thing is that somebody who stands perhaps on the other side um, is also able to make this measurement and the theory also works for him. So, th so, so this, is, this, is, this is the very, um, uh, this empirical approach to nature, this, this is the, in, in my point of view, the essence of science and, 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 and this is the, the, the very important thing that you do measurements and you interpret those measurements in terms of a theory in order to challenge those theory to say, to verify or to falsify it. Um, the truth is also, we can never verify a theory, we can also falsify it and we, we believe in a theory as long as we have not falsified it. Um, every theory has a limit because the limit is our own perspective. Um, Newton was, was without any question a genius and when you start wondering about, um, about physics then one of the first things you learn in, in school or at university is um, uh, the, um, Newtonian mechanics uh, which has very po powerful principles when Newton for instance is saying that the force is equal to the mass times the, the acceleration. And this is a very important principle because you can deduce a lot of um, uh, formulas which you otherwise would just get from, from empirical measurements. You can deduce that from this basic principle. So that was very powerful. That's, that was a huge success of Newtonian physics in that time, but it has certain limitations. Newtonian physics not only describes um, uh, if I throw a ball um, here in, in this room, it also can describe the planets who move around the, the sun and the sun who moves in, in our galaxy and the galaxies who move around in, in, in the whole universe. The problem, however, is that it, it's not exact. Uh, there, there are when, when we measure this exactly, we found that what New the Newton theory would, would, uh, Newton theory would predict um, is not exactly what we measure. And the reason for that is because the Newtonian theory doesn't work in the limit of huge masses. So again, force equal mass times acceleration. But when the mass is really large, like the, the mass of the sun in, in the universe, then uh, we require certain corrections to that. And this is given by a far more fundamental theory, which would be then Einstein's general relativity. So, so this is always important when, um, when, when talking about, about science. That, that each theory works only in a limit. And now we have a quite good understanding about what gravity is in the universe and in the whole cosmos, but we have no understanding what gravity is when we go to, um, uh, when we go to the world of quantum theory. That means when we talk about, um, about really um, um, elementary particles, when we are in the world of the really, really small. Um, however, um, science, or in particular physics, um, would like to describe nature from all length scales, so from the really large cosmos to the really tiny interior of, of each atom. Um, and by speaking here to this community, it, it's important to, um, to distinguish that to something which might be um, spiritual, which is not my domain of expertise, um, which is very personal. Um, if if, if, if somebody, and, and I think a famous example is Dr. John Dee, the, 
the mathematician of the of of the English Queen during a certain time, when he starts um, challenging angels and write down his language. This is something which is very personal to him. This is not something which, which I can reproduce because I don't know how to do that. So this does not work in the scientific lingo, but this does not mean that this is not right or correct. There are certain things which, um, which science cannot describe. Science is not about emotions. Science is not about perhaps some, some persons say the, the most important force in the universe is love. Science has no theory for love. Science cannot describe that. Um, so, so, so each time, and this is back to our discussion what we started there. Each time, when um, when when it comes up to that war, which is particularly in the United States going on between science and and religion, um, where you have fanatics on both sides, then then the problem is that science or the person say, they, they, they try to falsify certain things with, with their own methods, but these methods are not appropriate or developed, in my point of view, um, for that. I mean, it, I don't need to go through the Bible and say, oh, this cannot be because we have a, a evolutional theory for, for, for that. It's, it's just, a different, uh, just a different concept. And this I w really would like to clarify when, um, when, when Amanda asked me to speak here about science that it, it is this one approach to, um, to study nature. However, it's a very powerful approach because I guess nobody would argue that um, the core of Western civilization is science. Um, what, what moved the, the 19th, 20th, but perhaps also the 21st century forward was, um, was, was scientific developments um, and the technology which, our technologies which emerged from, from, from science. So it's it's a it's a very powerful approach, and um, and what Amanda this is the discussion we had the last time. She said, yeah, but science could be perhaps more powerful um, when um, when we put spirituality in or, or mysticism and, and and all of these other concepts, magic perhaps, and and I don't have an answer for that. We we had a long we had of course a long discussion. Um, about that, because the, the the problem is these worlds have, over the time, really um, um, separated each other, and and perhaps have forgotten to how to talk to each other, and and science is of course right now in this very arrogant position um, that it's very proud of what it has achieved and says why don't we need anything else? Why should we change um, change our concept? Uh, however, when we had this discussion, we, we identified um, examples of um, where um, where this actually happened, and and this example. I, I now have skipped perhaps a few That's of nice. those those items, um, and and one of these examples um, is um, a scientist, um, which is which is named Wolfgang Pauli. So he's a Swiss scientist, spent most of his time in. Um, in um, in German-speaking countries, Denmark and and United States. The, the, the interesting question would be here and now. I guess who has ever heard the name Wolfgang Pauli? Okay, only a few persons. Um, Wolfgang Pauli is a is a Nobel Prize winner and was considered, for instance, by Albert Einstein. And I guess everybody here in the room uh, has 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 heard about Albert Einstein as um, as, as the greatest physicist. After him, so Einstein was clearly away, uh, aware of his position, and and he also wanted that Wolfgang Pauli takes over his chair at Princeton. So he really encouraged him and 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 worked hard to do that. And Wolfgang Pauli has made really um, very important contributions to to quantum theory. Um, he was a um, ultra intelligent um, man, a very successful physicist. Um, respected in the community, but also feared in the community because um, he always saw the, the f errors and mistakes in the theories of others and never had a shame to point this out um, as clear as possible, which of course annoyed those persons who worked hard on a theory and then somebody comes around and says this does not work for them and that reason and you need to admit yes and you feel ashamed, but then you're angry on that person. Um, so Wolfgang Pauli was driven by the idea 
to, um, to um, find the theory of everything. What is the theory of everything? This is connected what Amanda wrote down here, perhaps with string theory. So we have, over the time, in physics we develop, or in science, we develop certain models how we describe nature. The most famous one is perhaps the old one by the Greeks, where you say you have four elements, you have a fire, water, uh, air and, and, and earth, if, if I did this right, I'm not so familiar with that model. Um, and and, and, and this, this, this is a very, this was, this of course is wrong, yeah? I mean, nobody would in nowadays teach that in school, but it, it, was, it was remarkable from that point of view that person said, okay, we try to deduce the properties from nature from a fundamental model and this model should be limited by, by something which, which at this moment had only four ingredients. And these four ingredients made up everything. Um, and, and this is exactly what later happened with the, um, the chemical elements, where we can say everything here in this room is built up by a few of these chemical elements. All of these chemical elements are made of atoms, and these atoms are made, have electrons in their core and protons, and uh, have a a electrons in their shell and protons and neutrons in their shell. So the, the remarkable thing is that everything which is around here, these huge different things which all had a different kind of meaning, we call all can, from a meta point of view, we can just deduce that to protons, neutrons, and, and electrons, and depending on how many protons and neutrons are in the core and how many electrons are in the shell, we, the, we see a difference if something is, is oxygen, which we have here in, in the air, or a lot of carbon, which, which we, for instance, have here in the shelves or, or which we have, uh, have in the books. Um, so, um, um, so now we have identified as fundamental particles, but also um, when we do a model, we want to know how these fundamental particles interact with each other. And, and in physics, we, or in science, um, we have just found um, basic interactions between um, those. And one of the most famous one is um, um, electromagnetism, so light, um, which we are all familiar with, that is electromagnetic wave with a certain uh, wavelength. And, and, and this, this allows us to, um, what we see here as colors, these are just electromagnetic waves with a different frequency or with a different wavelength. Um, and, um, and those particles, they interact with these fundamental interactions. And we, what we would like to do, we would like to start from as many interactions we can identify and unify them to as few as we can. Because scientists are always lazy and, and you want just to have a few things instead of hundreds and thousands of things. Um, and one attempt, a more modern attempt to do that is, is string theory. But Wolfgang Pauli at this time, he had no idea about string theory. So he started this on his own and he did not succeed. I mean, a lot of marvelous physicists have, ne have, have not yet succeeded in this task. Also string theory, that, which was really very popular in the 90s and beginning of, of this century, it, it's really a little bit stuck and, um, because it's, it's such a challenging task. And Pauli put this on his own, and he, um, he at a certain moment, um, did not find any answers more in the language of science. The language of science is math. And he started to, um, to then really study magic in order to find, find answers. And um, he, in particular, studied also certain works from, um, from Kepler because he somehow um, started to identify that certain numbers might have a certain meaning in, um, in life. And, um, and so he, he started to, um, and, and for him, the number four was, for instance, important. And that was going back to some work from Johann Kepler, who was an astronom in, 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 in the Middle Age, or at the end of, of, of the Middle Age. Um, and, and Wolfgang Pauli, um, um, when he started, um, he st um, studied his PhD with somebody, a physicist called Arnold Sommerfeld. And Arnold Sommerfeld measured a very important constant in physics, which is the Sommerfeld constant or the electromagnetic constant. And the value of that is to very good approximation 1 over 137. And at a certain moment, Wolfgang Pauli, who believed in numbers, um, he got seriously ill, was in a hospital. And when he realized that the room number of his room is 137, 
<laughs> he realized um, that, that, that he will not die. And this also happened. He died very age of 50, around 55 approximately. So, so he, really, he really was convinced about that. Um, he was also really starting to get depressed about that, um, <coughs> that he could not solve that. So that is where, where the name Karl Friedrich von Weizsäger comes up. That was a younger friend from him, and he wrote him a letter saying at a certain moment, and at that time he was also in the hospital saying, I cannot do it. You need these young, smart brains of, for instance, you, in order to solve this question. And, um, and, but he, has, he was, um, had problems with, with depression, and he has also dreams which really troubled him. That, um, that he started at a certain moment um, to, um, to approach Kai Gustav Jung. So he heard about um, Jung's approach to that and also dream analysis and stuff like that. So he, he met with him and, and Jung immediately realized what a tough client that would be and said, no, no, I don't take you. I have a young PhD student. Uh, sh um, she should um, take you over. But over the time, um, a friendship emerged between them and they really try to combine um, their concepts. So, for instance, um, Jung published once an article where he um, combined psychoanalysis with some of the knowledge which was written from, from Kepler work, and, and Pauli published once an article about um, synchronicity. Um, uh, so um, so this, 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 was, this, was a, this was a remarkable friendship between them. There are also, there's, there are also books about that. Um, because this is really, I mean, there's no question that Carl Gustav Jung was a genius. There's no question that Wolfgang Pauli was a genius. And this is perhaps one of the few cases, perhaps the only case I'm aware of, where exactly that happened, what um, Amanda is hoping for, that there is um, um, a relation between um, um, science and um, and sp spirituality um, mysticism um, and yeah so um, um, I guess I more or less covered many of those things so perhaps instead of talking and talking and talking um, because I think I already 